So there's a settlement in the Pacer class action, which will give a whole bunch of people their money back if they've spent money looking up federal court cases on the federal government's electronic filing system. Pacer is the public access to courts electronic records. It's the federal court system, civil cases, bankruptcy cases. It's an information technology system and it certainly needs to be funded and, and adequately staffed with IT support and developers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they charge 10 cents per page. What's a page on an electronic filing system? Well, it's easy for PDFs. They, they charge you by letter sized page, 10 cents per page. If it's a 30 page PDF document, you get charged $3. Over 30 pages, they just charge you $3, which is at least some kind of a limit. But 10 cents a page for electronically stored documents is a lot. That's eerily close to printing costs. 10 cents a page, sometimes 25 cents a page. Various local county court systems will charge you different rates, but some kind of round number, 5, 10, 25 cents a page, something like that, is normal for printing costs. Printers are complex. They use toner, paper costs, somewhere around 5 cents a page just to have clean, fresh paper. So there's costs involved, but, but then translate that to an electronic system. Why would you need to pay 10 cents a page? The case was officially captioned National Veterans Legal Services Program. It included the National Consumer Law Center and the Alliance for Justice against the United States court system. It's a little weird because you don't normally sue the court system, but yeah, that's what they did. They sued the court system for basically overcharging outside of the law for access to electronic records, the court docket. And note here that this is a settlement. This is a class action. This is a settlement. So they're looking for approval of this settlement, but it does mean that the parties have agreed to the settlement. And they write, In the history of American litigation, this case is unique. A certified class action against the federal judiciary. The plaintiffs challenged the fees that the judiciary charges for access to records through its public access to court electronic records system, PACER. They sought to vindicate a single claim, that the judiciary violated the law by charging fees that exceeded the cost of providing the records, and they sought one form of relief, refunds. After more than six years of hard-fought litigation, the plaintiffs have now secured a historic settlement under which the government must reimburse the vast majority of PACER users in full, 100 cents on the dollar for past PACER charges. The settlement creates a common fund of $125 million from which each class member will automatically be reimbursed up to $350 for any PACER fees paid between April 21st of 2010 and May 31st, 2018. That's a lot of PACER fees. <laughs> Those who paid over $350 in fees during that period will receive their pro rata share of the remaining settlement funds. Any unclaimed funds after this initial distribution will be allocated evenly to all class members who collected their initial payment, subject to the caveat that no class member may receive more than the total fees they paid. In addition to this remarkable monetary relief, the case has spurred the judiciary to eliminate fees for 75% of users going forward and prompted action in Congress to abolish the fees altogether. By any measure, this litigation has been an extraordinary achievement, and even more so given the odds stacked against it. Pacer fees have long been the subject of widespread criticism because they thwart equal access to justice and inhibit public understanding of the courts. But until this case was filed, litigation wasn't seen as a realistic path to reform. That was for three reasons. First, the judiciary has statutory authority to charge at least some of these fees, so litigation alone would never result in a free PACER system. Second, few lawyers experienced in complex federal litigation would be willing to sue the federal judiciary and spend considerable time and resources challenging decisions made by the Judicial Conference of the United States with little hope of payment. 
Third, even if the PACER fees could be shown to be excessive and qualified counsel could be secured, the fees were still assumed to be beyond the reach of litigation. The judiciary is exempt from the Administrative Procedure Act, so injunctive relief is unavailable. A lawsuit challenging PACER fees had been dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, and advocates had been unable for years to identify an alternative basis for jurisdiction, a cause of action, and a statutory waiver of sovereign immunity. That last one's kind of fun. The U.S. government has sovereign immunity, the real sovereign citizen. So you can't sue the U.S. government unless the U.S. government gives you permission to. So there are actually grants of permission giving potential plaintiffs or injured parties permission to sue the government for certain kinds of claims. So not only did the PACER lawsuit plaintiffs have to find grounds grounds for their lawsuit, they also had to find grounds to overcome sovereign immunity. Let's see how they did that. So they devoted their efforts to other strategies, making some records freely available in a separate database, downloading records in bulk, and mounting public information campaigns. These efforts were important, but they didn't alter the PACER fee system. Despite public criticism, and despite being reproached in 2009 and 10 by Senator Joe Lieberman, the sponsor of a 2002 law curtailing the judiciary's authority to charge fees, the administrative office of the U.S. courts did not reduce PACER fees. To the contrary, the office increased fees in 2012. There, things stood until 2016 when three nonprofits filed this lawsuit under the Little Tucker Act a post-Civil War era statute that provides jurisdiction to recover an illegal exaction by government officials when the exaction is based on an asserted statutory power. The Tucker Act is a federal statute by which the United States government has waived its sovereign immunity with respect to certain lawsuits. There's the Big Tucker Act, which applies to claims above $10,000 and gives jurisdiction to the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, and the Little Tucker Act, which gives concurrent jurisdiction to the Court of Federal Claims and the District Courts for the recovery of any internal revenue tax alleged to have been erroneously or illegally assessed or collected, or any penalty claimed to have been collected without authority, or any sum alleged to have been excessive, or in any manner wrongfully collected under the internal revenue laws, and for claims below $10,000. So the Little Tucker Act is the authorization or waiver. The United States has sovereign immunity, so it's waiving its sovereign immunity and saying, you can sue us for this reason. And the applicable reason here would be a sum alleged to have been excessive as in the PACER fees were excessive. So kind of like a tax or other fee or penalty by the government. Because the act provides jurisdiction only for claims seeking money for past overpayments, the plaintiffs could not demand that the judiciary lower PACER fees going forward. They could only seek retroactive monetary relief. Even with this limitation, this lawsuit has been a resounding success at every step. The plaintiffs defeated a motion to dismiss and obtained certification of a nationwide class by early 2017. Through discovery, they were then able to shine a light on how the office had used the fees. Many things funded by the fees, such as flat screens for jurors, had nothing to do with PACER. This discovery, in turn, led to an unprecedented decision. In March of 2018, this court held that the AO had violated the law by using PACER fees to fund certain activities. Within months, the judiciary announced that these activities would no longer be funded with PACER fees. Success continued on appeal. In the federal circuit, the plaintiffs attracted an impressive array of supporting briefs from retired judges, news organizations, civil rights groups, and the sponsor of the 2002 law, all detailing the harms of high PACER fees. And before long, the AO announced that it was doubling the quarter PACER fee waiver for PACER, eliminating fees for approximately 75% of PACER users. If you stay under this fee waiver threshold, you don't get charged for your PACER usage. 
I think it's $30 per quarter. Uh, maybe they doubled that, or maybe that is the doubled number. I'll put it up on the screen. Then the plaintiffs secured a landmark Federal Circuit opinion unanimously affirming this court's decision. The litigation sparked widespread public interest in the need to reform PACER fees and jump-started legislative action that continues to this day. Following the Federal Circuit's decision, the House of Representatives passed a bipartisan bill to eliminate PACER fees, and a similar proposal with bipartisan support recently advanced out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. The Judicial Conference, too, now supports legislation providing for free PACER access to non-commercial users. Were Congress to enact such legislation into law, it would produce an outcome that the plaintiffs had no way of achieving through litigation alone. As for the fees already paid, the claims at issue here, they will be refunded. Under the settlement, the average PACER user will be fully reimbursed for all PACER fees paid during the class period, and no class member will need to submit a claim or make any attestation to be paid. This is an extraordinarily favorable result for the class, and it easily satisfies the Rule 23E2 class action criteria. As we will explain, the plaintiffs asked the court to enter an order finding that settlement approval is likely and certifying the expanded settlement class, approving the notice plan and directing that notice be provided, and then scheduling a hearing to consider final approval and a forthcoming request for fees, costs, and service awards, for the class representatives. In other words, the lawyers would like to get paid too. So for anyone interested in further details, they're going to go into some much greater detail here in a moment. By statute, the judiciary has long had authority to impose PACER fees as a charge for services rendered to reimburse expenses incurred in providing these services. In 2002, Congress found that the PACER fees, which were then only seven cents per page, were higher than the marginal cost of disseminating the information, creating excess fee revenue that the judiciary had begun using for other projects. Congress sought to ensure that records would instead be freely available to the greatest extent possible. To this end, Congress passed the E-Government Act of 2002, which amended the statute by adding the words, only to the extent necessary. Despite this limitation, the AO twice increased PACER fees in the years after the E-Government Act's passage, first to $0.08 cents per page and then to the current $0.10 cents per page, during a time when the costs of electronic data storage plunged exponentially. This widening disparity prompted the Act's sponsor, Senator Joe Lieberman, to reproach the AO for charging fees that were well higher than the cost of dissemination against the requirement of the e-government Act. Excessive PACER fees have inflicted harms on litigants and the public alike, whereas the impact of the excessive fees on the judiciary's $7 billion annual budget is slight, these harms are anything but. High PACER fees hinder equal access to justice, impose often insuperable barriers for low-income and pro se litigants, discourage academic research and journalism, and thereby inhibit public understanding of the courts. And the AO had further compounded the harmful effects of high fees in recent years by discouraging fee waivers, even for pro se litigants or journalists or researchers and for nonprofits by prohibiting the free transfer of information by those who obtain waivers, and by hiring private collection lawyers to sue people who could not afford to pay the fees. I didn't know they, I didn't know they sued people who didn't pay their PACER fees. That's, that's pretty terrible, especially if those people couldn't pay their PACER fees and should have had a waiver. So, in April 2016, three nonprofit organizations filed this lawsuit. From the start, the plaintiffs are represented by an expert team drawn from various law firms with experience in these sorts of things. The plaintiffs asked the court to determine that the PACER fee schedule violates the e-government act and to award a full recovery of past overcharges, the only relief available to them under the Little Tucker Act. Because the judiciary is not subject to the Administrative Procedure Act, the plaintiffs could not seek injunctive relief requiring the fees to be lowered in the future. The court denied the government's motion to dismiss. A month later, the court certified a nationwide opt-out class of all individuals and entities who paid PACER fees between April 21st, 2010 and April 21st, 2016, excluding federal government entities and class counsel. 
the court certified the plaintiff's illegal exaction Little Tucker Act claim for class-wide treatment and appointed Gupta Wessler and Motley Rice as co-lead class counsel. The plaintiffs then submitted a proposal for class notice and retained KCC Class Action Services as the claims administrator. The coin approved the plan. Approximately 395,000 people received notice. About 1,100 of them opted out of the class. Informal discovery followed. It revealed that the judiciary had used PACER fees on a variety of categories of expenses during the class period. These include not only what the judiciary labeled as public access services, but also the case management electronic case files system, the CMECF system for for lawyers and parties to file things electronically, the electronic bankruptcy notification system, communications infrastructure services and security or telecommunications, court allotments, and then four categories of expenses falling under congressional priorities— Victim Notification, the Violent Crime Control Act, Web-Based Juror Services, Courtroom Technology, and, quote, State of Mississippi. I mean, I live in the state of confusion, but the state of Mississippi is worse. Based on this discovery, the parties filed competing motions for summary judgment as to liability only, reserving the damages determination for after formal discovery. The plaintiffs took the position that PACER fees could only be charged to the extent necessary to reimburse the marginal cost of operating PACER and that the government was liable because the fees exceeded that amount. So you should only charge what you needed and they charged more. The government, by contrast, took the position that all PACER fees paid by the class were permissible. It argued that the statute authorizes fees to recover the costs of any project relating to disseminating information through electronic means. In March of 2018, this court took a third view. As the court saw it, when Congress enacted the E-Government Act, it effectively affirmed the judiciary's use of PACER fees for all expenditures being made prior to its passage, specifically expenses related to CMECF and electronic bankruptcy notification. The court thus concluded that the AO properly used PACER fees to pay for CMECF and EBN, Electronic Bankruptcy Notification, but should not have used PACER fees to pay for a State of Mississippi study, the VCCA, web juror services, and most of the expenditures for courtroom technology. So PACER fees were supposed to be for PACER, not for jurors in the courtroom, not for whatever the state of Mississippi project was. Uh, This other stuff is great, sure, but we're trying to pay per page for documents, not support the whole federal judiciary. That's for your taxes and for Congress to appropriate in their budget, not for you to just keep charging excessive fees. It really is an access to justice problem. Even making a pro se... Uh, informal pauperous litigant apply for and obtain approval of their status as informal pauperous and therefore not paying any fees, those are hurdles to jump through that will deter some litigants who can't pay for things. In the months that followed, the AO took steps to implement the district court's ruling and reduce potential future legal exposure. It announced in July 2018 that these four categories would no longer be funded with PACER fees. The judiciary will instead seek appropriated funds for those categories, what did I just say, as it does for over 98% of its budget. A year later, the AO announced that it was doubling the quarterly fee waiver for PACER from $15 to $30, so now $30 is the number, which had the effect of eliminating PACER fees for approximately 75% of users. Both parties then sought permission for an interlocutory or during litigation appeal from this court's decision, and the federal circuit accepted both appeals. The parties adhered to the same interpretations of the statute on appeal. The plaintiff's position was supported by a broad array of amici curiae, a group of prominent retired federal judges, Senator Lieberman, media organizations, legal technology firms, and civil liberties groups from across the ideological spectrum, detailing the harms caused by high PACER fees. In response, the government defended the full amount of the PACER fees while strenuously arguing that the court lacked jurisdiction under the Little Tucker Act. 
The Federal Circuit rejected the government's jurisdictional argument and largely affirmed this court's conclusions. It agreed with the district court's interpretation that the law limits PACER fees to the amount needed to cover expenses incurred in services providing public access to federal court electronic docketing information, not juror technology, courtroom technology, etc. It also agreed with the district court's determination that the government is liable for the amount of the PACER fees used to cover the Mississippi study, VCCA notifications, e-juror services, and most courtroom technology expenses, excluding digital audio recordings of courtroom proceedings. The Federal Circuit noted that CMECF was a potential source of liability because the court could not confirm whether all those expenses were incurred in providing public access to federal court electronic docketing information. The Federal Circuit left it to this court's discretion whether to permit additional argument and discovery regarding the nature of the expenses within the CMECF category and whether PACER fees could pay for all of them. Following the Federal Circuit's decision, federal lawmakers swung into action. The House of Representatives passed a bipartisan bill to eliminate PACER fees and a similar proposal with bipartisan support recently advanced out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We know that already. On remand, the case was assigned to Judge Friedman and the parties came together to discuss the path forward. They understood that litigating the case to trial would entail significant uncertainty and delay. Years of protracted litigation lay ahead, and the range of potential outcomes was enormous. On one side, the government argued that it owed zero damages because the plaintiffs could not prove that but for the unlawful expenditures, PACER fees would have been lower. A litigating position that also made it difficult for the judiciary to lower fees while the case remained pending. On the other side, the plaintiffs maintained that liability had been established for those four categories of expenses and that some portion of the CMECF expenditures were likely improper as well. Hoping to bridge this divide and avoid a lengthy delay, the parties were able to agree on certain structural aspects of a potential settlement and then agreed to engage in mediation on the amount and details on December 29th, 2020, at the party's request, this court stayed the proceedings until 2021 to allow the parties to enter a private mediation. Over the next few months, the parties exchanged information and substantive memoranda which provided a comprehensive view of the strengths and weaknesses of the case. The parties scheduled an all-day mediation for May 3rd, 2021 to be supervised by Professor Eric D. Green, an experienced and accomplished mediator agreed upon by the parties. With Professor Green's assistance, the parties made considerable progress during the session in negotiating the details of a potential class-wide resolution. The government eventually agreed to structure the settlement as a common fund settlement rather than a claims made settlement, and the plaintiffs agreed to consider the government's final offer concerning the total amount of that fund. But by the time the session ended, the parties still hadn't agreed on the amount of the common fund or other important terms, including how the money would be distributed and what to do with any unclaimed funds after the initial distribution and the scope of the release. Professor Green continued to facilitate settlement discussions in the days and weeks that followed Followed, and the parties were ultimately able to agree on the total amount of the common fund, inclusive of all settlement costs, attorney's fees, and service awards. The parties then spent several months continuing to negotiate other key terms while this court repeatedly extended its stay to allow the discussions to proceed. Further progress was slow, and at times the parties reached potentially insurmountable impasses. But over a period of many months, they were able to resolve their differences and reach an agreement, the final version of which was executed on July 27th of 2022. So they really want you to know they worked really, really hard on this. And, and I appreciate that. I think they did work really hard on this, and this is great. Okay, the settlement class, I think we can start skipping some of this. It's going to be everybody who paid PACER fees between April 21st, 2010, and I think May 31st of 2018. You're going to end up releasing any of the claims that are covered by this thing unless you opt out. They'll provide notice to you, but I think it's opt out, meaning you're automatically in. You will not have to submit a claim or make any attestation, prove the amount that you're due or something they have kept records and they should be able to refund based on your records. It looks like the first $350 is due to everybody who paid 
up to $350. So if you paid $270, you're going to get $270. If you paid $350, you'll get $350. Then if you're due more than that, if you paid more than $350, they'll take whatever's left over after everything else gets paid and then split it among your, the rest of the people. So if you were due $450 and you got $350 and you're due $100, but they only have $1,000 left, uh, you know, if there's 10 people making claims, you'll get 100 but if there's a million people making claims, then that'll be divided by a million. The distribution will be made within 90 days of receiving the money from the United States. It hasn't been approved yet. The money hasn't been transferred yet, etc. If unclaimed funds remain, those will be distributed on a pro rata basis, as I just said. The plaintiffs intend to apply to this court for a service award of up to $10,000 per class representative and for an award of attorney's fees and expenses. So that's to uh, sort of make it palatable for someone to be the class representative and pay the attorneys who otherwise don't get paid. Or would have to charge the class representatives. Uh, they don't really do that too often. So then the rest of this is sort of formal and technical language asking the court to approve the settlement and explaining how it affects the class and everything. Then they ask the court to grant the settlement order. So yeah. That's what should have happened. It appears that the federal judiciary was spending the extra money like it was a slush fund and not saving it or, or charging a more appropriate fee. I can certainly understand that you have a seven cents per page fee and at the end of the year you realize you have some extra money, so adjust the fee next year so that you don't overcharge refund some money if you end up with extra money at the end of the year because you overcharged. Hopefully that will be the new policy going forward. I don't know exactly what's happening between 2018 and 2022. I guess someone's going to have to sue over that if you don't get automatic refunds for that. So I'll keep an eye on this one, and if it's worthy of an update, I'll make an update video. But I expect that within the next few months, this settlement will be approved, the government will pay the $125 million, and then everyone will get their money back. So, you know, if that happens by Christmas, that would be a nice little Christmas present. A couple hundred dollars for those of us who have been paying our fees over the years. Because they're doing 100% refunds, does that mean the U.S. judiciary just has to take the loss on the cost to run PACER for the last 10 years? Yeah, so this is, I don't know exactly where the government gets the money for this kind of thing. That's a good question. If they've spent the money on e-juror and bankruptcy notifications and things like that, and then those costs turned out to be false or whatever, and they have to refund those costs, but they're not going to sell the e-juror system. Like, they still need their e-juror system. They still need their courtroom screens or whatever. So I think the government just eats the money and it has to be reappropriated in the next budget. And yeah, there's going to be some approval system for that kind of thing, where if the government agrees to a claim, then that claim has to be paid by something and that money has to come from somewhere. So yes, that will end up making it into some kind of appropriation somewhere, yes. I don't know how that works, though. So someone could maybe fill us in in the comments. Thanks for watching! Special thanks to my top supporters in October, Evie, Spirit Bear, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Good Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, King Ares, and Kyle Seifring. You can support more Lawful Masses productions on Patreon.com slash LJFrench, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for my weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.